Hello and welcome to the EFN Presents review of Season 4, Episode 13, Simple Ways. Joining me today from EFN News, I have Reldan. Heyo. And joining us from Fob Equestria is Jake the Army Guy. Howdy howdy, Internet. What's up? Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for letting me join the little big boys club here for a little bit. So, My Little Pony Love Triangle... What was your guys' reaction when you saw that in the episode? First thing I thought was, oh god, we got another waifu thief on the loose. <laughs> you know, Flash Sentry is trying to steal Twilight, and now Trainer Hope is trying to steal Applejack and Rarity. Hide your waifus, everyone. It's definitely a little bit different um, of an approach. They usually don't go much into a romance angle on the show, but... I don't. I think it worked out for this episode. It, it definitely was played mostly for laughs, and I, I think that it succeeded in that front. It was it was very comedic, so I, I think they did a good job of, of using that. I didn't go into it obviously expecting some deep introspection on the nature of romance and friendship, but for a goofy little episode about a silly crush love triangle, it was very entertaining. I think it makes sense to let Rarity, because I mean, we actually have seen her with the whole Prince Blue Blood thing in the first season, that of all the ponies, she would be the one that you could believe, you know, might have kind of a crush angle going. But at the same token, it's, you know, you clearly see Applejack is just completely not interested at all. So, so that ends up, I think, working out. Well, yeah, it's also, I was talking to Ramble about this earlier, it's actually a very different sort of crush, because you got to think with Blue Blood in season one, it was more just the, the, the white knight uh, fantasy of hers, of, you know, this, the, she didn't know anything about Blue Blood. She it was just this handsome prince, and she just created this entire big fantasy in her head. Whereas this time, it was like an actual crush. Like, she knew the guy, knew his personality, and really liked him. And so to see her just kind of go all gaga and try to hide under Twilight's tail was very adorable. Oh, well, that's the big difference here. People are saying, well, Rarity wasn't swooning over Prince Blue Blood. But the thing there was, she was in love with the concept, the ideal, the story, and she played the role she would play in that situation, whereas this was just flat out, no script, crush, and yeah, you could see that Rarity, being the dramatic one, would be the one to overreact in that kind of situation. Yeah, I think, though, that in this case, I mean, it definitely is a thing where at the beginning, I mean, I think she thinks that she knows him, but clearly when he actually arrives, I guess maybe she knows him from like his writing and pictures and, and that kind of thing. So I think she thinks that she gets him. But the reality is that what he's looking for, what he's interested in really is nothing like, I think, what she was anticipating. Yeah, I, I could see that. It's I, I, I do understand it's a bit more of still the fantasy in that this persona he puts on, but she didn't know the actual kind of depths of who he was. So I, I get that, yeah. And now, regarding the love triangle aspect of the episode, you could ask, well, why didn't they just have Rarity go after Trenderhoof? Why did they have to drag Applejack into it? But I think it really works well here because we've already established time and again that Applejack and Rarity are basically foils of each other. That's been leveraged before in episodes like Look Before You Sleep. And this almost felt like a bizarro version of Look Before You Sleep by the end of the episode when they've switched characters. But in terms of the moral, the lesson being someone else, the fact that Rarity would become her opposite to impress someone, to get Trenderhoof to like her, I think that that really sells the extent that Rarity's going to go, as well as adding comedy because they are opposites. Like, you see Rarity with a southern accent. That was beyond adorable. And I just, this episode more than anything confirmed in my mind that Tabitha St. Germain is the best voice actress on the show. Because to have a character, to play a character with an accent and then add an accent on top of that was just, it, it was it was surprising. And the way she pulled it off so well in that it, it, most people or most voice actors, I think, in that sort of situation would go full out and actually have it be an actual Southern accent. But the way she butchered it so well is was very impressive to me. <laughs> yeah, it was like in Party of One where you have Andrea doing Pinkie Pie doing the other party guests. Yeah, I mean, it, it was so horrible, and that's what made it hilarious, because it, it, it's so fitting. It, it It's exactly the way that you would imagine it would be if a character like Rarity was trying to do that. So, I mean, it, uh, she she just absolutely nails that perfectly. I do have to admit that Rarity was beyond adorable in her little uh, trouser, her uh, overalls. 
that was like cute beyond. It's the no legal reason for it to be that cute. Well, there's almost a descent of rarity in this episode <laughs> where she she starts off and she has this jewel encrusted, very floral apple picking basket with lace on it. And she's dancing over to the tree to knock an apple down. And by the end of the episode, she's in patched coveralls and she's got a straw hat on and she's rolling around in mud. And it's almost, I don't want to say a subtle decline, but I think seeing that transition... Yeah, the dis- descent into madness. Uh, yeah, it makes the most of the journey. Rarity doesn't just show up and have a straw hat on in X country. You actually see her knocking it up a notch because her efforts go unrequited. I was going to say that. I, I mean, I think that's the part that really makes, that really kind of sells me on the episode and the plot as a whole because I, I was kind of curious as, you know, how, how are they going to take a character like Rarity and, like, you know, get her down into, you know, overalls and mud and stuff like that and how are they going to sell that to me and make that be like something that i would think that her character would actually do and i think by graduating it 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 actually makes it work well it's through desperation she's not yes. just oh i'll be applejack she integrates elements of what she thinks he's attracted to and obviously when it doesn't pan out it's because she didn't go far enough so obviously she has to go further Exactly. She was rarely trying to be Applejack, and then she was just trying to be Applejack. But on Applejack, I really think the biggest strength of this episode is when I first heard... I avoid spoilers, like, as much as I can. Like, I didn't even know Discord was going to be in Threes the Crowd until he showed up. I'm that much of a spoiler ninja. But when I first heard the term, oh, this is going to be a love triangle, I was like, oh, no, they're not going to have Applejack and Rarity vying for this guy's attention. Please don't. So when I started watching it, and the way Applejack was completely not having it when this dude was all fawning over her, and how she was so far removed, cause if it had been a lesser show, it would have been that. Those two sort of bickering, fighting over the boy. But to see Applejack completely not having it at all, and just that, oh, good grief, look she has all the time, that's what really made the episode. Uh, yeah, well, I think the big thing with Applejack's use in this episode is the fact that she's there to prompt Rarity to change, and then at the end, she intentionally mimics Rarity to show how foolish Rarity's acting, how foolish she looks. And I think that keeps all the characters true to form, because Applejack's focused on the farm, like Rarity should have been focused on the Ponyville Days Festival. She loses complete sight of that, and she's willing to sacrifice her vision that she had from the beginning of the episode for the festival simply to impress this guy. So I think that Applejack really needed to be there to be the voice of reason, so she really couldn't be invested in the triangle. Well, I think that Applejack in in this episode, and I think in this season really, has kind of progressed. She she now is, in all these kind of comedic episodes, she, she's the perfect straight man or, or straight mare for the MLP cast, because she's a reflection upon all the other characters acting in really ridiculous ways. And by her kind of being there and being very, I don't know, just being herself, being level-headed, it makes all the other ridiculous things that everyone else is doing just seem all that more ridiculous and all that more hilarious. She's almost like the, I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Arrested Development, but to me, she's almost like the Michael Bluth of the, the main six. Well, that's the strength of, of Applejack's character is, like you said, she's the straight man. She's, you know, Abbott to Abbott and Costello. She's Moe to the Three Stooges and that her deadpan common sense is what lets, lets everyone else being goofy and wacky and crazy kind of fly off. She's like the bass guitar of the heavy metal band that is My Little Pony. And I'm getting this because, damn it, I'm a big Iron Maiden fan, so I'm going to make a, me- <laughs> I'm gonna make a metal pony uh, analogy, it. But that you know she's she she's the kind of the glue that holds it all together. She's the base that everyone else sort of bounces off of. Well, she's the baseline that lets you appreciate the extremes that the other characters go to because it, it contrasts so well. And speaking of extremes, it was wonderful, wonderful to see another good old fashioned rarity drama breakdown in this episode <laughs> because we haven't seen one of those for a long time. That whole scene was terrific, but especially her exchange with Spike, because that's another love triangle that's going on, essentially, with them. Except Spike doesn't play the game that Rarity does. I don't know, I guess he's adapted to the whole situation by now. 
Yeah, poor, poor Spike. I, I, I have a, ser a totally heterosexual man crush on Spike. So going into this episode, I was really hoping we would see a little bit more of his reaction to it. And the way he did, sort of the deadpan fourth wall breaking look at the camera when they already asked, do you know what it's like to like someone who has no idea you feel that way? And he's like, dude, really? Was very, very fun to watch. Yeah, I actually liked Spike this episode. This actually might be my favorite. I don't know, maybe Power Ponies, although there were a few parts about that that annoyed me with him. But this episode, I think it really, he wasn't played off for comic relief really at all. I mean, he, he definitely seemed to be in that position where he was clearly, I mean, he was kind of in the know. I mean, he, he was there to be supportive. He, he really almost, being that character who who definitely, you know, we all know has a crush on Rarity, but he's the example of how, like, how to do that right. I mean, he's there, he's supportive, but he's not changing who he is to try to meet Rarity's expectations. He's, he's basically there and hoping that she'll come around to like him as much as he likes her at some point, but not by trying to pretend to be something that he's not. Well, they could have used his character more in this episode. I think that him being an example of how to act to Rarity's how not to act works well, but there's also that existing Spike and Rarity dynamic, and I don't think there was a reason to change it in this episode. It works well, we haven't seen it too much in this season, and it's subtle, but that works, especially as a contrast to how Rarity is dealing with her situation. Yeah, and I've I've long said that, well, part of me would love to see a little more look into that aspect of Spike's mind. I mean, the show really doesn't have to. I mean, that, to me, I've always said that's what we have fan fiction for, to kind of dive into that a little bit more. The show itself handles Spike's crush on Rarity as realistically as you would think it was, because he's a little kid with a crush on a grown-up, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I guess the other thing with Spike, like you were saying in Power Ponies, Spike was played well, not really made the butt of the jokes, and they really avoided making him the butt of the jokes here as well, and they could have, they really could have. Like Pinkie Pie at the beginning, her head inflates to this balloon and she floats away. Are you saying that she's an airhead? <laughs> That's terrible. It's terrible. Whoa, hey, I got a million of them. Hey, now. Well, right after the Pinkie Pride episode, to see Pinkie's character almost regress to something you laugh at, not with, that was kind of upsetting. But Spike works well here, because he's kind of supporting Rarity in her crazy adventures. I mean, Spike has a straw hat and a banjo. That's funny on its own. You don't have to do anything to his character. You just have to do things with his character. And they do that here. And it works. Yeah, I mean, he's a funny character. I mean, uh, Kathleen Westlock does an amazing job uh, voicing him. It just seems like a shame because a lot of the time he gets used in a way where it's like if they had just written his character and kind of done more of like the in the no sarcastic spike that I think that people like more. I, I think there's more humor, there's more comedy to be had with that than, you know, having him stepping in buckets and bad things happen to him for no real good reason and everyone just laughs at it. With Spike, he's not the straight man in the way that Applejack is, but he's more of He's kind of a little more the audience for late character, a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that that's that's definitely a good a good way to put it. I mean, I, I know probably not a lot of folks may have split opinions about Equestria Girls, but I think the way that his character was in that movie of being the one to just kind of point out the obvious. I mean, that's a good way to I think use Spike to basically interject those little comments where you're assuming that the audience is probably thinking these things and it's like hey why doesn't a character actually just point this out and, and then and then he does and it's great that was always very funny to me in that the one time where they really i think nail spike's character and have him be the best he can be is when they made him a flipping dog <laughs> well it's like in the show he's a dragon surrounded by ponies he is an outsider he's not one of the elements of harmony he can be that outsider character as a main character, as part of the main group. And that's a role that none of the other characters can fill the way that Spike can. Very much so. It's funny we're talking about Spike in this episode, because he really wasn't in it too much. But most of the main six were in it even less. Which is surprising for this season, because most of the episodes have tried to focus on the whole group. 
And this really only focused on Applejack and Rarity. And I think it's because their characters work so well together. This is something that Josh Haber, the writer, had mentioned in a review of Castlemania, that sometimes you just take characters and throw them in a situation and see how it plays out. And that's part of how he writes. I think that if they'd had more of the main six featured in this episode, it just would have detracted from the story because they just eat up screen time without necessarily contributing to the interactions that the episode is based around. Well, see, season four has had a problem of shoehorning in the rest of the main six for no reason. And the downside of that is sometimes when you have a character with only like 10 seconds of screen time, you have to boil them down to their very base characteristics, which is why a lot of times, like when Rarity, it's not, if it's not a Rarity episode, Rarity comes across as a selfish vein. Yay! Or Pinkie Pie comes off as some sort of... Airhead? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so the fact that they didn't shoehorn in every single character into every scene of this episode was another very good thing. Yeah, I think some of my favorite episodes, and, and this almost harkens back to season one and early season two, where they had a lot of focus of doing these kind of pairings episodes, of taking just two members of the cast and putting them together and then giving them an interesting situation and seeing how they played off of each other. That, that reminds me of a number of the earlier episodes of the show. And it, to some degree, I'm, I'm seeing some of those concepts kind of coming back in season four. I mean, I think another episode in a similar vein was Pinky Apple Pie, where it really just was a focus on Pinkie Pie. And again, with Applejack put into an interesting situation and just seeing how it responds. And that actually wound up being one of my favorite episodes of the season so far. And I, I honestly think that this is probably up there with that as well. I, I just really like this dynamic where they can take two characters and take the time to explore them in depth and really kind of get at what's great about those characters. Right, that's where My Little Pony is very much... I think, I think when people always talk about they want more adventure arcs, My Little Pony's at its best when it's slice of life, because like you said, they can examine the characters closely, and that's what really makes the show appeal to so many people, is that these very relatable characters, and so seeing how they bounce off of each other, is that's when the show is at its best, when it's taking two characters and examining how they interact with each other. And you just don't see that in episodes where the characters get shoehorned in. Because like you said, I mean, what are you really going to do with like a 10 or 15 second bit on like one character? You'll have an episode like Three's a Crowd where in 10 minutes you go through four or five characters and you've basically learned nothing interesting about any of them. That can work at some point when if, if it's for gags. Like Three's a Crowd example, like with Pinkie Pie, she was pretty much just a gag character. And you know what? I, I liked it. That's what I like about Pinkie Pie is that you can do that. She can be this interesting character like in Pinkie's Pride or A Friend Indeed. But at the same time, she's the character that if you boil her down to her base elements, like I said before, she's still entertaining because you can do a lot with her. So sometimes it works, but sometimes it quite doesn't. Oh, well, with Three's a Crowd, I think one of the things with that episode is it wasn't a real slice of life type story. It was a very specific situation that required all the pieces to fall into place, and all of that needed to be conveyed to the audience. If Discord had just shown up with Twilight and Cadence at the Star Swirl the Bearded exhibit, and then said, Well, Fluttershy was running me a ladder, and I decided to come here now, and I'm sick, and you have to take care of me, and blah blah blah. It would have been like five minutes of him just standing there spouting exposition. I think that getting the main six out of the way did eat up a lot of time in the episode, but it allowed a lot of variety to be added to what would otherwise be a very exposition-heavy scene. Getting back to this episode, I mean, okay, I know I'm, I'm playing the stereotypical brony here, but I did have a little hee-hee-hee moment when uh, Trenderhurt was talking about how I take the uninspired, the blah-blah, and the unappreciated and point it right at Derpy. I'm like, hee 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 that was fantastic. It's like, it's funny because in that scene, it's like it's panning left and right and you see Derpy there and it's like, oh, I think I know. And then it's like, boom, hits you. And it's like, yeah, that, that is that is perfect. Well, that's one of the strengths of the season so far is that we've seen reoccurring regular background characters like Bulk Biceps was in this episode, you know, who I still I still like Snowflake. I still think that's a better name. But hey, I'll take Bulk Biceps because it's canon and whatever. But yeah, that way he was standing there like he's part, it, it, it builds a sense of you really feel like this is a town, you know, and it kind of makes it feel a little more, I don't know if I want to say immersive, but it feels a little more real. 
Uh, well, yeah, the earlier seasons, they had these background characters, but they were just that. They had no names. Well, they might have had some internal names, but they really had no names, no identities, nothing. Well, what do you do with them? Well, they're just wandering around in the background or doing something random. It doesn't matter who it is because they're interchangeable. But by season four now, even to the people on the show, whether it's to some exposure of what the fans have kind of bestowed upon these background characters... Or just internally, if they have some idea of what these characters are considered to be in the town, you can have the recurring background characters mean something because they're not just interchangeable background assets. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. I mean, I know in the early seasons, and I mean, really, it, it probably comes down to just a budget and a time issue, but you definitely had scenarios where... You know, it would be like copy and paste. Like in, in any sort of crowd scene, you could easily see the same pony be there three or four times simultaneously. And now you can definitely see that they, they take great care, I think, in picking, you know, which background ponies are there and making sure that, you know, everything kind of makes sense. It's it's really an evolution of, of the kind of the amount of care and detail that they put into the show. Kind of digressing back to the discussion of the adventure-based versus slice-of-life-based episodes, at their core, they were always trying to convey some sort of lesson, whether it was that your friends need you or how to act, and the adventure aspect of it might have been more to get in a different audience or get people's attention, especially when you're not as invested in the characters at that point. But at its core, it was still trying to tell some of the same lessons the slice-of-life episodes were, just in a more abstract sense, a little less realistic setting. And I don't know, I think that that can still work. Do you think there's room for both of those kinds of stories here? I would say that there, there is. I, I would agree with Jake's point, though, that without the slice of life is really what gives the characters, I guess, that oomph, that quality that gets people interested in the show. And once you've kind of built that up, you can take those same characters and, you know, throw them into an adventure. And, you know, still have, you know, an entertaining, a fun episode, but it, it's kind of, it really comes back down to, it's like, you, you want to see how these characters interact with each other on the day-to-day -day basis, not just like constant crisis mode all the time. It's harder to relate to a character when you can't relate to their struggles. Battling dragons isn't something most people do, but having sleepovers is. On that, you got to think about, we know how these characters react in a crisis, because we've seen it so many times. We know that Flourish High is going to be scared. We know that Applejack and Rainbow Dash are going to charge in head first. We know that Twilight's going to sort of take charge and whatnot. So we know how they're going to react when there's some sort of big disaster. So it's not, I mean, while it's fun to watch, it's not really interesting to see, if that makes any sense. So, but Slice of Life, like I think uh, Reldon just said, it lets us see these characters and how they react in new situations because we don't see them every single day 24-7 as much as we would probably love to. So the slice of life is where it really examines the characters and we learn. that's where we learn new things about them. And that's the high point of the show, at least to me, is that when we learn new little sneak peeks at what goes on inside their head. You think that when you abstract away the everyday situation into more of an adventure-based setting that you lose a bit of that nuance that really lets you relate to the character's situation? Well, yeah, and because I don't watch My Little Pony to see a group of superheroes. If I want to watch that, I'll go re watch reruns of Justice League or something like that. This is where I want to see normal characters interacting in their day-to-day -day lives. I don't always want to see them save the day. I want to see how they solve these little interpersonal conflicts like this. Like a pony, someone who has a crush on someone, but that someone likes someone else. And so how far do you go to try to get their attention before you realize you're not being true to yourself anymore? You know, I do think it would be interesting, at, and it might be something they explore at some point. Because a lot of the times when they do an adventure story, they, they tend to feel the need to do an adventure that involves the entire main six. And as Jake mentioned, all the characters have pretty well-defined roles in terms of how they work together as, as a group when they're faced with you know, a situation like that. But it, it might be kind of an interesting take if they took some of these pairings, you know, maybe more unlikely groups. And is, you know, if they're not all there, then you know, who steps up? It's like if Twilight's not there and Applejack's not there, then you know, how do they work out you know, who's in charge? I mean, there, there, could, there could be some area for them to explore on the adventure side by kind of forcing some situations that 
you know, and then seeing how those play out. I mean, it'd be similar, I guess, to the way that some of these slice of lives play out. But I mean, I, I think that there's room there to to fit the adventure model in. Right, well, we've seen that in in Princess Twilight Sparkle when Twilight wasn't there, the Tree of Harmony, and how they started bickering because they couldn't make a decision of how to proceed, how to go forward. So they needed Twilight there to fill that role. Well, it's time again for final thoughts and scores. So, Jake, could you give us a recap of your thoughts in this episode and give it a score from one to five? Oh, I have no idea. If I had to think about... See, I don't like rating uh, episodes as far as, like, 5 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 or whatever. Just because... That's my problem is I like Pony. I mean, people say, like, oh, I like the writing or the music or the adventure or blah, blah, blah. You know what? You know why I watch the show? I watch for cute ponies and the occasional giggle. That's what I like. So even when the show is objectively bad, like Mysterious Meredewell or Spike at Your Service or Feeling Pinky Keen, I still enjoy it. I, I still like the show, even when it's quote-unquote bad. I mean, heck, I even like Equestria Girls. Well, well, first time I watched it. That's not for repeat viewing, but anyway. So I don't <laughs> like assigning a number value, but if I really did enjoy this episode, I liked how Rarity's obsession play off with Applejack's indifference. But I, one thing I, I had to say is I've people know me as I think Applejack is best pony. So going in this episode, I made the joke on my Facebook that uh oh someone's trying to steal my waifu. And then I, I as I watched it, I'm like, wait a minute, this guy has blonde hair, blue eyes, wears glasses, is awkward around the girl he likes, and dresses like a dork. Oh my god! <laughs> and, then, and, and then I felt very very odd because yeah, but all in all. I really couldn't think of anything I would have wanted more from this episode that I didn't get. I mean, it would have been nice to see a little more of Spike's perspective on it, but he wasn't the focus of the show. So, as going by my incredibly low, broad standard of cute pose and occasional giggle, I laughed my butt off at Rarity's attempts to do Southern accent. I squeed like no matter when she looked like a bumpkin or that adorable outfit that she put on Apple Bloom. I think that needs to be the big picture meme for this for this episode. So going by that standard, this was a highly enjoyable episode. And yeah, ponies. Real Dan, what about yourself? Kind of going, coming where Jay says, it's like I'm I'm not usually like if you ever read any of my written reviews, I don't normally or I pretty much never do a numerical score on episodes because I I prefer trying to hope by the time that you get done reading it that you. Basically, you know how I felt about the episode through my words, but I'm in the same boat. There's really not a whole lot more I would have wanted to get out of this particular episode. It contained rarity, it contained Applejack, and I think that they play so well off each other. It was it was very humorous. Uh, the plot went along really quickly to the extent that I was like, oh, it's a minute or two left in the episode. It's like, where did all that time go? It's just, I was just enjoying it and laughing and just being like, this is absolutely, utterly fantastic. So I think this was probably in the top three, top four episodes of the season that I've seen so far. And I think that's pretty high praise given that there have been a lot of good episodes so far this season. So the only thing I could really think of that would make this episode better, and this isn't even something that would happen within the episode, would have been if there had been some setup to Rarity's crush or to the Trenderhoof character or something, just some mention um, in a previous episode that kind of set it up a little bit more to just, I don't know, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing or something. Because then, you know, when this actually happened within the episode, you'd be able to look back and be like, oh, okay, you know, they're they're referencing this thing that I've heard of before instead of, you know, oh, Rarity has this massive crush that's apparently gone on forever, and she has a shrine devoted to this pony that we've never actually seen or heard of before at all. Oh, one little thing I'll say on that is that a nice touch is the characters are as completely lost as the viewer is. Rarity's talking about Trenderhoof, and everyone watching the show is like, what? And the main six are like, who? Who is this person of which you speak right now? I mean, that was a good nod towards towards that, but I don't. I feel like it would have been stronger to have had just a little bit of setup for it. I can agree with that, but at the same time, it's the the problem with they're introducing so many new things in every other episode. I mean, this isn't like the season two season finale where it's like, yeah, you couldn't have dropped the word shining armor in one episode of the entire season run. 
But with this, they're making so many different little things that they try to keep adding that continuity, it'd be the entire show, you know? That's a fair point. Well, <laughs> once again, I think I agree with a lot of the points you guys laid out there, so I don't want to rehash those. I think what I'll do is focus on some of the more subtle or not so subtle things in the episode that really show the level of attention that the rest of the team, the storyboarders, the animators, bring to the show that just made this episode for me. One of those being, back when Trenderhoof first sees Applejack at Sweet Apple Acres, it does a bit of a rack focus from him looking at Rarity to Applejack in the background. And when Rarity interrupts him, the focus doesn't come back to her. He's literally paying that little attention that he doesn't even focus on her when she's right in front of him. Or Rarity's dramatic breakdown where she's bawling her eyes out and Spike asks what's wrong and she whispers, nothing. It's, I don't know what it is about Rarity's character and those scenes, but it just goes so well together. The lesson was really well integrated into all aspects of the plot and it plays to the strengths of the established character dynamics. But even without all of that, it's worth watching just for how well put together the whole story is and how effectively it uses its characters for both dramatic and comedic purposes. And I guess this is the scoreless episode, so I will rate it nothing out of nothing. So you hated it because you rated nothing. Oh my gosh, you hater. <laughs> uh. Well, that about wraps it up for this week. Once again, my guests from EFN News were Rel Dan. Hey, thanks much. And Jake the Army Guy from Fob Equestria, thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Tune in next week for a review of Season 4, Episode 14, Philly Vanilli. Blame it on the rain. Sorry. <laughs> this has been EFN Presents. Thanks for watching. <laughs>